again, thank you all so much. Um, we're going to do a short Q&A. I want to introduce uh, Lorenz Grant, who's the producer of the film. Uh, Louis Erskine. And again, uh, thank you all so much. Um, the film will be, uh, it, it was made for American Experience on PBS, and I want to thank them so much for all their support and uh, giving us the resources and the time to make this film. Um, it'll be on in a year from now, January 2011, which is the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Rides. Uh, and until then, we're going to do uh, you know, as many festivals as we can. We're, um, uh, they're going to do, I think they're going to do a limited theatrical release, like eight to ten cities. And uh, we're also doing, uh, they're going to take uh, 25 uh, college students uh, on a recreation of the Freedom Rides, uh, college journalists, st journalism students, and they will write back and blog back and tweet back, or whatever that is, <laughs> and uh, do all that good stuff um, ab uh, about their experiences going on a recreation of the Freedom Rides. Um, so we're here for questions. Are there questions? Yeah. Uh, the question was when we talked about Martin Luther King and the Lord, and there was a splitting away. We talked about the Panther movement. Uh, no, I think it was more SNCC. There were there there were you know objections and, and splits in the movement later on between uh, SNCC and Martin Luther King and, and other people, uh, the younger people in the movement and, and SCLC. Um, that's what we were referring to. I mean, part of you know this this film is is about the the real beginnings of the civil rights movement and you know it's about Martin Luther King becoming Martin Luther King and and the Kennedys becoming the Kennedys that, that we all know um, and so th we thought it was important to to make those points yeah uh, I'm gonna let Lorenz answer that oh um, the question is how do we get Governor Patterson um, well, part of my job as a producer is sort of to find everyone, and um, so someone gave me a tip that he was still living, and um, so I, <laughs> and it turned out to be true, and oh, that was so thrilling, trying to find him. Uh, so he basically lives in a remote, you know, cabin and whatnot in Alabama, and um, I kept calling and kept calling and kept calling, and then once we established a relationship, um, I think it became clear to him that you know, once he understood the scope of the film that we're doing, we were going to talk about him regardless, mm -hmm. and it would have, you know, behooved him to be in, in, in it. And I think he did want to, to speak and unleash something as much as he could. I think there probably is some remorse there. Um, when we were talking, it was very ironic that Obama got elected. And so, according to him, he told me he voted for Obama, but <laughs> I don't know. Um, but then, once we were on the journey, he also opened his archival collection to us. So, um, there was some films that he had in his barn um, of the reception he attended uh, for Kennedy. So, that's included in the film. Um, so, that was you know, part of the journey of how we got here. Um, I don't know. You know, it's kind of hard to think right now, actually. But I think I think that uh, you know, um, I mean, it was it was just great getting Governor Patterson. I think the thing with uh, Martin Luther King and Delord um, was really fascinating. I think the you know the stories of the Kennedys evolving also was just um, kind of incredible. Um, I'm trying to remember. Um, yeah, I mean, we got you know, and, and there were there were some really lucky things that happened with footage. We got. The actual footage of the bus burning, um, we actually see the, the aftermath of the Aniston riot. Um, we got from the FBI, um, and we had, we had read a transcript the, uh, from a hearing done afterwards um, that said that, that, the F, that this guy said, you know, the FBI confiscated my son's Super 8 camera because his son ran out there and shot. So, you know, we kind of backtracked that and actually sent that page to the FBI and said, you know, well, where's 
where's this footage? And they said they didn't know anything about it. And we said, well, here's the court testimony that said you, you actually uh, had confiscated it. And eight months later, they, they called and said, oh, so, hey, we found the footage. <laughs> it was just incredible um, that that actually happened, and they sent us the footage. So that had, never been, that had never been seen before by anybody but the FBI, if they even looked at it. Yeah, in the back. Yep, yep. Did you, try, did you attempt to um, find out more about the assistant to Governor Patterson, who basically set a precedent when he told him, if you tell me to protect him, I will protect the governor. Yeah, he's passed away, um, you know, and, and I mean, everybody always said that he was just, you know, he was just this, he was a lawman, and that's what, you know, he said, you know, look, I, I'll, I'll, I'll enforce the law, that's my job, you know, and that's how he looked at it, you know, um, but he, he's passed away. Yeah, I was, uh, I thought that scene in the home in Montgomery of the civil rights leaders and the students was really a great moment in the film, and it pointed out for, for many of us that the, the movement was more nuanced and that the leaders had clay feet and that the students had amazing courage. And I'm wondering, did you know that going in, that that was gonna be a major theme or did that emerge as you started to do all of your interviews? Um, did everybody hear that? Yeah. Okay, so um, no, I, th I think that that's something that emerged. I mean, we, we knew that, that the, uh, the young people were part of it, but I think that, that we didn't really realize kind of what, that it was kind of so, we divided it up into three waves so that we could kind of grab hold of it, you know, because it was, su it was su such a cumbersome story. So, you know, the first wave was the first 12 people, the second wave was, this, was basically the kids from Nashville, and the third wave was that over 400 riders that, that finally came. And so um, that was something that we learned you know, and how to divide it. And then I, I think, you know, we, we even learned that, that this was really the civil rights movement developing. And it was, this is really for us where the civil rights movement becomes a movement. You know, before that, there had been isolated incidents at Greensboro sit ins, the Nashville sit ins, of course, Martin Luther King and, and the Montgomery bus boycott. But those were all local. Those were local things with local people. This was the first time that people from all over joined in and it became kind of the hallmark of what the civil rights movement would become, um, this uniting of people. Um, and so I thought that's one of the things that really gave the story more fascination. Yeah, up there. Oh, thank you. It would, want, it would be a great achievement for us if people took this film as a call to organize it. And it's so, it, it's so true that uh, rights weren't given, they were won. Um, and that's, that's one of the hallmarks of the civil rights movement. And I think it's one of the things that really differentiates then from now, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, it's like, it, somebody in, in another screening compared us to the election of Obama, which was a huge compliment. You know, like, you know, to have Obama elected in my lifetime, in my son's life, my son is 15, he's only 15, is a huge thing. But, but the piece that we forgot is that putting him in there is, is one part, right? Yeah. The other part is, excuse me, kicking his ass into doing what we need done. <laughs> you know? and, and one of the things that the Nashville students so clearly knew, one of the lines that's, that's um, Bernard Lafayette says about 10 days, that, we, that didn't make it into the film is that they, they, it wasn't just, they wouldn't just go do something. It was a strategy. It was a long-term strategy because they knew that if, if they could get the front page of the newspaper for 10 days, they had a movement. All right, so we need that kind of thinking back. And I think part of that um, with the outreach uh, and the reaching out to students is uh, trying to get students to, you know, what would make them get on the bus, you know, what what would they fight for? Um, and hopefully this is somewhat of a reminder of, you know, it was average people who really took the challenge. You know, it wasn't, you know, everybody wasn't an icon. It was really your neighbor. Uh, so, you know, hopefully that's part of the longer plan for, for college students who often feel just this crushing, overwhelming, 
you know, responsibility or, or lost in the morass of history, not knowing where to begin. But, you know, in a way, they're the luckiest generation because they have every tool, electronic tool, to their disposal. So um, hopefully with the social networking sites and getting organized, you know, they can organize themselves locally in high schools and communities around the world. Okay, the, the question was, the, the first wave, what happened to them after the second and third wave? Uh, Hank Thomas, uh, kind of the big guy, um, who gets hit in the head with a baseball bat after he's already off the bus, he's the only one who, who rejoined the ride. He rejoined the ride. The others, you know, some of them were very, very severely beaten, uh, and, and some of them uh, suffered with their injuries and, until, the, until their deaths. So he was the only one who could, who was physically able to continue, and he did go back. Uh, and continue, and, and then went to parchment and, and the whole deal. Yeah, go ahead. If you had gotten on that bus that day, it would have been united and been two sooner? If King had gotten on the bus, would it have been ignited and diffused sooner? I don't, I don't think so. I mean, I think that, that you know, I don't, I don't blame King for not wanting to get on the bus. Um, you know, he probably would have been arrested. Uh, he had outstanding charges, you know, and uh, he was Martin Luther King, and they may have made an example of him uh, and revoked his bail and all that kind of stuff. And, and I think, you know, all's well that ends well. I think, it, it, <laughs> you know, it worked, and they did what, what they needed to do. And so, so you know, I don't want to question his decision or, or what would have happened. I think it all worked out. Yeah, I'm sorry. Speaking of people, I was wondering how you found the woman who was the little girl who brought water yeah. to the Hezbollah um, yeah, uh, we found a lot of the people, the film is based on a book called Freedom Riders by Ray Arsenault, uh, and he had already found a bunch of people, although I don't think he interviewed Janie, um, but, but, but they had had a 40th anniversary, and Janie actually became kind of an honorary freedom writer, and goes back to the reunions and things like that, and so um, people kind of knew where she was, she had moved to California, she was thought of, which is funny, when we did the interview, she said that, that she was thought of as kind of insane, in the town, and people didn't really wow. retaliate because they thought she was just crazy, you know, to give those people. I mean, why, you know, she was just, it was just so weird for her to do that. They thought she was crazy. Yeah. Uh, let me, I'm sorry. Just an observation, two questions. It's sure. interesting. The entire movie, you never saw a lawyer in the whole time. Thank God. Yeah. You're not a lawyer, are you? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> you took charge of doing something. Uh -huh. I'm sure that you hear the Selma March, 63 maybe? Yes. Yeah, I think someone's 63, this is 61. Um, and the other question he asked about the Greyhound Bus Company, well there's a, a great story that, that we couldn't include, um, one, because we, we didn't have the time, we, just did, we didn't have visuals for it, but where Bobby Kennedy actually gets on the phone with the, with the Greyhound Corporation, and the guy from Greyhound actually recorded the conversation, and, and, and wow. then um, they published it in the Southern newspaper, and Bobby Kennedy's screaming at the guy and, and, and starts calling him, you know, uh, Mr. Greyhound, you know, let me talk to Mr. Greyhound then, if, I can't, if you can't give me a bus driver. He says, well, then, well you gotta have some black drivers, maybe a, maybe a Negro driver will drive the bus. I said, we don't have any Negro drivers. He says, you know, you gotta get, somebody will drive the bus. He's like, I'm sorry, you know, uh, you know I, I'm sorry, Attorney General, we, nobody is gonna drive that bus. We cannot get anybody to drive the bus. Um, and, and the only reason, they finally did get one guy who would do it, but uh, his supervisor actually rode the bus with him, and that was the only way they could get any kind of bus driver to get him out of Birmingham. <coughs> yeah. Yes, they, it's quite extraordinary what they did and then the lives that they lead, um, particularly Bernard Lafayette. I mean, he is specifically involved in nonviolent movements. Like, he's even been to Colombia and trying to, you know, work with the rebels there. I mean, he goes literally all over the world doing this, and he teaches. So many teach on, like, the collegiate level 
or high school level, or they're involved um, you know, in community organizations, you know, grassroots groups. Some are ministers and retired from the ministry. Uh, so they really did um, lead lives like that. And I'm sorry, we'll probably have time for one more question. We just need to get another film in. Thank you. We got one more. Yeah. Was any of your family members involved in the rides? Um, no. <laughs> any other? <laughs> <laughs> Well, I think all these comments belie the fact that this is a film festival, and this was a beautiful film. Yeah. It's a very powerful film.